This is an end of the house of motivation for me. Is that it was really, really well explained. The program Children of the Good, that nowadays involves hundreds of kids living in a risky situation, has already been doing an experience for many years, making a huge difference in their lives. And it was a program that I participated in its foundation. It really needs funds for those who have already done social work. You know, the resources are never enough, right? We're always trying to make ends meet so it can run by itself for us to fulfill the expectations of all of our public. Therefore, yes, my intention was to do something charitable for this program. However, secondly, I couldn't even say it's the second place. It's a tie with the first place. It's the idea of teaching what values are, what tools we can count with as human beings, exactly for us to be human beings. So I always play around. If you have already watched one of my YouTube videos, have you? Everyone, wow, it's really unanimous. So you get already the idea of me saying that I got all raged for many things. One of these days I bought one of uh, these equipment and I got that reaction once again. It was a toaster. The manual had more than five languages. Not, it had even Arabic. It was out of this world, world for us to have a manual just to open and close the lid. And I thought to myself, couldn't human beings have a manual too? Because it's more complex to deal with human beings than any other machine I know of. Surely more than a toaster. In other words, we don't have any type of manual. One of the most complex things is to establish why and how we work. As for any other gadget, it's important for us to know the two things. I always say because it's a situation that is real, when I have a malfunctioning appliance, there's a guy I trust, so I leave it there with him, and he fixes everything for me, anything you can think of, from TV to a blender, other, any other utensil. And I imagine if one day I bought an exotic machine and gave him because it was not working without saying what it was for, what it did when it was working. Do you imagine that? It's a hypothetical situation. I buy a machine, I don't know, for example, to make sushi in Japan, and I leave it there and don't tell him what it's for. And he's going to call him and say, look, Miss Lucia, I can't fix it because I don't know what it does when it's working. Isn't that obvious? And a human being, how do we fix a human being? What does it do when it's working? Do you understand that this is fundamental? What will be his objective? What will be the fruit of expectation for him that is working perfectly? So the establishment of a meaning of life that in general, we're not taught to do that without within our educational process this is taken it's not taken into account because it thinks that everyone should do it for themselves and it which is very complex and the other element is that we can't don't know what are the tools we can count with so going back to the buttons of the machine that i was talking to you about a toaster there is a manual explaining what light turns on what lines turns off and we have many tools we need to know how to use and there is an objective we need to find for ourselves. And there is a set of things. One thing I can assure you, I have 30 years of New Acropolis, and in them, 27, 28 years as a teacher, I can tell you for sure, with all certainty, that there is almost, is almost anything that is obvious, and obvious no longer exists overnight. So you think to yourself, people know what justice is. No, they don't. What they think that justice is everything that benefits themselves. If it benefits the other person, they don't understand anymore. People know what fraternity is. No, they don't. They think fraternity is what makes them be even with this, their post-mortem debt. In other words, I help until I feel exempt. If I die tomorrow, I am not condemned. I'm a nice person, isn't it? I, I always say that this is a type of credit karma because you pay your debt and when you die, you don't owe anything. It's impressive. People don't know the obvious anymore. And I reached that con conclusion. Obvious doesn't exist. So let's explain it. So a few elements that are fundamental. I always remember because I've had the opportunity, I maybe not the younger of you. I was from the generation that had a grandmother that had a lot of knowledge. She was a very old person, very simple, but relatively wise. And it was interesting how she had a few of her very concepts that were really 
solid. And I was really young at the time. It, there was a huge age gap. But I imagine that she knew what it was if he, we asked her what goodness is. Nowadays, people are so personal, so partial, so influenced by the mass, so turned into fashion. I think to myself, this in the future when she needs it, when she needs goodness, she's not going to find anything consistent. She just won't find it. And this is all based in a finding within philosophy. This is really interesting because you construct that once again in your own life experience. This is something that we offer in our new Acropolis course. And I'm not saying this because Aristotle or Plato said so, because there is my own life experience as well. I remember when once, one, once upon a time when I graduated and I was already enrolled in another higher education course, I hope that it's not the same. Instead of asking you to buy the book, they asked you to Xerox, photocopy the pages of the books from page X to page Y, a hundred books of pages. And I passed through a very tough situation. And I looked at the pile of papers and thought, is there one idea that can help me solve my problem at the moment? And there wasn't. And everyone, everything went straight to the trash because there was a bunch of information totally disconnected from a practical application and the need that I needed at the time which was to reach the other side without being less human, to get to the other side of that personal problem without losing my human condition. There was nothing there. So this type of perception that you get throughout life shows us that how in our current time we have to strongly introduce within education from childhood up to adulthood what a human being is, what nature expects from us, and what tools we can develop to accomplish within our nature's ex expectation, actually, which is an expectation from your own nature as well, because your human nature expects that from you as well. And that is to correspond. Correspond is to accomplish. So I started with the concept of good. It's not by chance. Goodness is a reflex from the idea of good. And because according to Plato and other philosophers, but mainly Plato, the idea of good is like the sun. In the myth of the cave, he talks about that. The sun that illuminates, that vitalizes, that provides life, that makes all things beautiful because things can be really beautiful. But in the shadow, everything is dissolved and beauty is lost. So beauty is like a center of life. Good is the center of life. For him, the good is equivalent to the man's psychological, moral, and spiritual life. And sun, light, is responsible for the same things to our bodies. So I, this is fundamental. That's why I wanted to start with that. I wanted to start with this the idea because, indeed, it's our axis. It's our sun. That is what it was made for. So let's see if we can advance a little bit about that. Education based on values. Today we're going to talk about goodness. Pay attention because I always need to reiterate this. Philosophers are usually bold and annoying creatures because it's always looking everywhere for ideas that can suggest new hints for him. Because answers are not inside myself. The answers are anywhere around me and we try to read in life. And something that is really good for you to reach a, your conclusion is for you to get any idea that you want to understand a little better. Not only researching historically what some somebody said, that is important too for you to get inherent knowledge from the past, but you go to Google Images and search for an idea there and see the predominant majority of pictures that appear. And you can see the collective unconscious for you to have an, an idea of pe what people are saying and thinking, and that is really interesting. I did that. I went to Google Images and I put goodness and I clicked and voila. And everything that appeared, at least practically 99% of it, was somebody helping in distress. Everything, everything. It was always doing something for someone in distress. How interesting, isn't it? Because nowadays we live in a society that teaches us to only think about ourselves, in our needs, in our interests, in our accomplishments as individual, in an individualistic way, in a derogatory this is the derogatory term of individual. So for you, that is so selfish. And that is to be in the spotlight. So 
haven't you ever heard of this expression before? Be in the spotlight. That is an expression that people use to be in the center of the stage and light it and everyone in the dark. So it's a society of the individualism and of selfishness. So when you talk about something so important, this virtue, goodness, everything that is shown in Google is somebody thinking about other people. is as if everybody, although not living for that, expected the others to do so. Because whenever they have the fear and they are in distress, they think that other that. And isn't that funny? Because imagine if we were extremely hungry for meat and when we looked for our recipes, we showed only vegetarian dishes our society is selfish so we always think about goodness somebody doing something for other people and people have some anguishness and you know what i did once i i need to share that crazy idea with you i hope that it's contagious one occasion i was going through trouble and sleeping and sleeping for me is a good sy symptom so because when you are at peace with yourself, that you have the tendency to sleep like a rock. So I started to ask myself, what were the things that wouldn't let me sleep well? Although I hadn't really done anything against my principles that day, there were some points inside me that didn't really keep me at peace between heaven and earth. Some behaviors that I had brought with life through, my, through all my life that weren't that I wished for. This is a tool that helped me to identify several points, some of which that didn't give me fullness and accomplishment. So it's important for you to identify them and to start working on them. So I imagine that each night these people co considered goodness to be that way, have a little bit of anxiety because they fall asleep and feel and start thinking about that. And that goodness in that way doesn't fit in their life's objective. So I want you to do that as well. I want to transform you into philosophers. And philosophers is a potentiality in any human being. I want to awaken that on you. I want to see smoke coming out of your heads. Do that experience at home. Stop and observe what doesn't keep you at peace with yourself. What is missing? What, what anguishness? What are the anxieties that lie within your soul, hidden in, your, in the background? And... What elements doesn't don't make you fall asleep right at peace and have the sleep of the fairman? So this research made me observe that society of insomnia because of that, because there's a lot of selfishness and, and a very altruistic projection of goodness. There is a little inconsistency in this thought. Inconsistency is usually what gives us insomnia. Even though you're not seeing it, you feel it and you know it. Let's continue. You're going to say, well, before she starts talking about good acts, who is good and who is not, she will probably give a lot of concepts, very intellectual ones, blah, blah, blah. Let me clarify something to you, because if you don't like it, at least it's not my fault, it's cunts. That's the logic of our society. If we find a guilty person, we can relax. Now we can be, we can let it be. Kant used to say, and that I agree with, because I think it's fundamental, if you want to convince somebody of something, you shouldn't give practical example. Oh, it's so good to be good. Didn't you see that girl over there? Did you see that guy over there? Look how happy he is. It's always questionable. The examples are questionable, always. You don't know her very well. I know that he's not so happy. And that guy, oh, I don't think he's as good as you portray. A practical example is, is always liable to be put at stake. It's not exactly that way. So go to ideas, go to the sphere of ideas and show something is logically possible. Because if you prove that one idea is logically possible, if it doesn't exist, one day it will. One day it will break through the resistance of matter and will be here because it's logically possible and it's a seed that will fall here and will fruit at one point, will, will bear fruit at one point. And if you understand it, who knows one day you will bear it yourself. And that's so important for the philosopher. And you know why I'm talking so much about philosopher? Because I want to bring that to light on you. And because philosopher is not a citizen that has a bachelor's degree in philosophy. That is an undergraduate un university co course in philosophy. The philosopher is the one that loves it, wisdom and possesses a carpenter bug within it. So the one who is looking for answers everywhere. And philosophy was born 
the first time that one human being started looking for these answers in nature. So this nature proceeds to the search of formal education. That is really important. So when we try to understand what Guinness is, we need to understand what is that in the sphere of ideas first. Even before that, let's understand what good is. Well, good idea is one of the most controversial in history, one of the most researched ideas, and there are so many concepts for it. And of course, I've selected a few that, ba that were based on what makes sense for me. The first point is that we are not the owners of any truth, but what ex my experience endorses what I am bringing for you to do. And not only endorses, but guides my researches up to the moment. If there is a person that is João da Silva that has a better answer than Plato, I'm going to listen to João da Silva because I'm not Platonist. I am. I, I don't follow any sect of Plato followers. I simply find his answers the best ones for certain things up to the moment, and understand that there is no absolute truth. There was a there is such an interesting characteristic. The other day there was a person stalking me on the internet saying but you don't have any truth. I said, no, we don't, but you're sure of it. Yes, I am, but you have one truth. No, I don't. This was so polemic that sounds funny here, but in WhatsApp 24 seven, it's not. The philosopher is safe when he knows he doesn't know anything and that he has found the best truth he has found so far, but he's ready for improvement. Do you understand that? When the human isn't ready for this practice of searching wisdom, he wants to have a solid ground. He wants to think that he has one truth, or else he feels insecure. It seems like he's going to fall. For the philosopher, the most insecure thing is for him to think that he owns the truth, because it's not true. Nobody has it. What guarantees the balance of the philosopher is the certainty that he is still searching for it. He is determined to improve himself. That is a threshold that seems small, but isn't. It's huge. It's frightening for someone to, who needs uh, ready, absolute, rigid th truths to live as a philosopher does. That is why it's something that we can't force. It's a click that is born from within out, and it comes from inside out. Idea. I am looking for the truth, and I'm improving myself every day. So we're Kant recommended I start with technology. All right, it's just discrimination. You have no idea how disconcerting it is for you to be walking down the street and have someone looking at you and smiling. And I start thinking, where do I know this person from? Blah, blah, blah. My childhood, I blah, blah, blah. My neighbor, I don't know, nothing. Nothing comes, nothing occurs. So you check from side to side and nothing. Anyways. Nice to meet every one of you, for those who I didn't have the pleasure to greet yet. Etymology. So I love speaking about that. It shows the origin of the words. And beyond that, it shows the intention that exists in, behind it. And that is lost. And it's really lost. And that invalidates, as Plato used to say, the sacred of all arts, knowledge, transmission. So for Plato, it's greatest of, of good was the word good the good came from it was the greatest of all ideas so it uh, it's equivalent to the light of the sun the idea of good is in the myth of the cave is equivalent to the light of the sun so good comes from the latin word bo bonus onus or bonus that is efficient in latin and somebody will ask efficient like in what what does that mean okay so i went further to, because I wanted to be sure what I was seeing. I went to the Indo-European. It's so nice to, to do that. You have no idea. There were there are so many interesting, important content behind one single world that it changed my concept. It made me understand certain words and the origin they had. The law, for example, the, this feeling with etymology, that is really important. I'm going to talk about that later in another sequence. So... It comes from the origin DU2. It's a system of philosophical there are dictionaries. It's really interesting for those who like. DU2 means to do, to have, to power to, to have power to, to worship. And I was even more interesting with that, interested in that word. So of course that idea of efficiency has to do with doing. 
and that is with power and with strength because goodness is always associated with weakness oh how nice he is a person that is so passive fragile being and the mosquitoes lay, lie on him and land on him and do whatever they want to the poor thing isn't it no it's power goodness is and its origin has to do with power and it has to do with worshiping because it's so great it, it brings something of great stature from within and it is a uh, it's so beautiful it is to reduce and to bring to life it's the fruit that comes to life when it it brings something to fill you and with that you need to be bigger than you are and that is something so profound it's so beautiful and it brings so many hints it doesn't it it's very interesting and it awakens many carpenter bugs at least mine it does and i hope that it does for you too so okay some of the questions this is the wall of conflicts that was the name i gave to it so what do i say when people ask me goodness is power efficient efficiency in what or being having power to be efficient in what and we would say what that what is the meaning of the you want to be efficient in becoming a human being right do you remember that machine I had it was sashimi or sushi machine? Oh, sushi, okay. It knows, it has an identity. It knows what it was made for. And the human being needs to know what it was made for. And goodness is for that. So if you don't have that spirit mission, that, that spirit of mission within yourself, then goodness is a useless too. And uh, secondly, this question, this affirmation that people say kills me inside. I'm extremely patient, like all philosophers, but there are some questions that kills us inside. Let's face it. So, oh, what, some things are good for me and not good for you. Everything is relative, isn't it? Oh, come on. The gravity that kills me will kill you too. I can't stand this excess of relativity applied in fields that Einstein didn't even suspect. For the love of God, come on, he was not talking about human psych uh, or he, human's moral. Let's be real. So when you're going on another field, you cannot just use the same tires. You have to use different tires. You have to wear, I, I don't know, four-wheel traction. I do follow my, my rationale, my, my train of thought. We're trying to understand what goodness is. Good is what's efficient, powerful, and that worships something that of great stature. So let's go. What should goodness make us more efficient in? Well, being good is being efficient in fulfilling our objectives of searching for the unit. That is platonic, but I'm going to explain it next. It's what Plato said, and that's fundamental for philosophy. So justice means minding one's own business. Do you believe that? I don't know. Call, call Plato and tell me where he got that idea from. No, he passed away. So oh, you only know that by heart? Yes. So it's worthless. There, therefore, you must have someone who have lived a little bit of that idea, or else it's just memorized. Okay, so I'm going to explain this idea first of unit for particular, which is really interesting. So if when the human being is put in the mission, he needs to go to this mission, connected to it, compromised to it, considering everything he is. And then comes uh, this part here that is a moral taxonomy. Do you remember that? The life classification, kingdom, division, class, order, family. Until today, I don't use that for anything but i know it by heart so you need to go from big to small first of all you need to think that you're a part of life and that already compromises me in second place i'm a, a part of humanity and that already compromises me and the last part the third part is i am joan da silva so that generates compromises and necessities and so just don't abandon all the rest and go straight to joan da, da silva like the romans used to say what is good for the hive is good for the bee and if the good if it not necessarily what is good for the bee is good for the hive so you need to start to thinking big and then go to the small and then that phrase 
of what's good for, for me is not good for you is not exactly correct. In relation to kind of pro compromise to life, we have a common compromise and it's not random. So in relation to the compromise to humanity, uh, we have a common com compromise, but it, when you are João da Silva and I'm Lucia Leana, maybe that's different, but not so different as we portray. Freedom is in, inside this sphere of individuality. And in relation to life and humanity, we are conditioned to what is expected of a living creature and a human being. We cannot go straight to the small. And we have to go from the small to, to the big, to, from the big to the small. And there are so many things that compromise us. We need to be mindful beings of life and of humanity. Many things compromise us and we should achieve the individual uh, experience. It's possible to act against life. Many people do. It's possible to act against humanity. Many people do. Do you, do you, you don't need to make that automatic. No, you need to make a mindful decision. Everything that I do in the first place, I remember that I am the member of life. I'm the member of humanity and I'm João da Silva. And if I am so integrated to the big, I am not selfish. I'm just personal. So let's understand unit, which is something so basic, so basic in the ancient world, at least between Greece and Rome. You know, those things that were universal and they're not anymore. Let's go back to this, to etymology. Universe comes from uno in Latin plus verteri, which is the verb to pour, to transform, to go in the direction of, to change in the direction of. So universe meant the one that pours into the uno and that is go, trying to go back home, to go back to uno. The universe is already giving us a hint of what it is. It's what was poured from the uno and what it will go back to the father's home. That is already in sacred books. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your, your soil into the house of the Lord's you God. It's there, the universe. It's said in so many ways, in so many places. What did Pit Pythagoras said at this his time? He said, then it, it went, everything went back to the primary unit. Then one, two, three, four, five, until it went to the nine and 10 plus, uh, one plus zero equals what? One again. So that is a primary unit. Do you get that? They go back to the unit, then go back to the primary emptiness, and they go go back, they collect all the experience and absorbs in itself. Wow, that is so abstract. What does have that, that have to do with our lives? Does it have anything to do with our lives? Yes, it does. I've caught you out of guard, right? Yes, yes, yes. Because if the universe is that going back to the uno, all the living creatures that are going back to the uno, they are evolving to a destiny to some extent. Simply put, the plants will go back to the uno the way the plants are supposed to, the animals as well. Even in the mineral world, the, the, the rocks will go back to the unos as well. As, as men, we're going to go back as human beings in that sphere that is called fraternity, which is nothing more than sowing sewing the divisions, converting what is divided into a one soul being. Our choices of friendship, family, all of them are longing to go back home. I need to unite what was separated, to join the pieces together. Do you get that? So when we understand that the meaning of our lives as human beings is to go back to the uno. This starts to guide our decisions. Simply put, if I'm going to make a decision tomorrow and it's really selfish and it doesn't consider the good of anyone, just my own, that decision gets me closer to the unit. No, it pushes me away from it. So what I was going to do tomorrow morning already needs to be rethought, considering that I'm a human being and that a human being, as all the other creatures are going to you know. Do you get that idea? This is an example that is really common because I really like to mention it in my lectures and people love listening to it. And I'm sure that if you have seen my lectures, you have seen that one fits all example. So it's from Professor Jorge Angel Livraga. I, I'm going to get you as an example. Okay. You, for example, you think that, oh, I don't like the sun. I don't like the sun. It burns the skin. It causes premature aging. I don't like it. So he, she closes all of the do doors, the windows, and 
she doesn't want anything to do with the, the sun. And one day she changes her mind. That is the amazing uh, thing about ideas. You can change your mind about things all the time. So she started to think, uh, having a glimpse of changing her re behavior and reconcile with the sun. Congratulations. So what does she do? She opens all the doors and opens all her windows. And the distance she was from the sun with the, and the, with the doors open or closed is exactly the same. But with her will to reconcile with the sun makes the light reach her in a whatever different way. So she already stopped living in the shadows and started living in the light. Do you understand that? Only the fact of getting in touch with this idea of the unit already makes today be different. I cannot just do anything because I'm being that is what I'm going to the unit. It's true that the closer I get to the sun, the more intense I'm, the light it will be. But uh, that attitude that I was going to have tomorrow morning is plausible. No. So if you do it anyway, you're going to have to live in, with contradiction, with inconsistency. Think about something that gives insomnia. That will be inconsistency. I've spoke about that in the beginning. The fable of the princess and the and the pea that uh, talks about a small pea uh, under seven mattresses. I have a suspicion that it's related to inconsistency because inconsistency is putting 100,000 ma mattresses on a pea and still feeling it under you. So it's like some sort of thorn and that stings at night. So either you are coherent consistent with that or you're not going to be you're going to be in trouble you're going to carry that price of inconsistency with you and that is unpleasant so plato used to say that good is everything that unites so if i'm going to the unit the closer i get to it the more similar to it i must be right while i'm walking to the unit i cannot be so selfish only thoughtful to, of my own interest as i was 10 steps ago I need to start noticing the other's pain. I need to start compromising myself and uh, to decrease other people's pain. I need to walk towards it and become similar to the unit. Remember the Bible, be perfect, there's, uh, therefore, as Heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, if you want to be, you know, you need to have a little bit of degree of unit to inside yourself as well. So good is everything that unites. This idea of his, which is out of the extraordinary is not only about joining but about integrating good is like recovery of the unit in the middle of multiplicity or else you would say that the traffic jam i face every day is is very very great it is like very it unites me to everybody isn't it no of course not it doesn't unite anything it just puts people contiguous uh, but each one is in their own world, totally isolated and irritated. So being integrated is when you generate a whole that isn't the same as both isolated parts. You integrate, you become bigger than the other person's with the other person's world. That good integrates and they feel they are part of each other. And that taking the other way from our life is like a motilation. Through the other, you can see yourself better. You can see like you can integrate all things it's like uh, putting the puzzles together the pieces of the puzzle together so um, um plato was a very impaired person i'm summarizing really quickly so he said that everything that is alive needs to pay a uh, tribute to good so everything that is alive needs to pay tribute to to good do you understand that idea your expression are really funny. You're looking at me with very crazy eyes. If you stop to think, the examples are the most bizarre ones. But it's the truth. Anything as bad as, bad as it can be needs to have a minimum degree of unity in it. Okay, let's think about it. The mob. What do you think about the mob? Ceciliana is starting to look like a nice girl with so many bad things happening in the world today. By comparison, she's starting to look innocent. The mob. Okay. Do you notice that it is a criminal institution with a criminal purpose? Okay. It's something bad, but it needs to have a little bit of good within. And what is good in the mob? It's loyalty. A mobster needs to be loyal to the other because 
imagine if you start betraying her and then betraying him and betraying everyone it explodes it won't exist as an institution so we need to pay tribute to the virtue to good to exist or else he wouldn't have cohesion force to exist and then what ends up happening people use good people use good to exist many times with a bad objective so i've noticed there was a bunch of virtues in the organized crime is an organization related to good that is used as a tool and of course that provides another scenario that we would have to give another lecture about that let's talk about integrity because there's scenario in society many people that with good intentions have less and less of these qualities of cohesion that would give them strength because good as you remember is related to strength so more and more they are bland while in many cases the crimes become stronger because they use virtues as means virtues can be used as means so plato said all of this about the you know about the idea of good that is strongly connected to the you know and how fundamentally advancing in the direction of good is advancing in the direction of the fundamental attribute of god or whatever you want to call it advancing in the direction of the you know good is the tool that gets you closer to the unit. And the more you use this, and not because you want to get somewhere, but for itself, the more you will feel accomplished as a human being. That is another subject we will soon talk about, okay? So I'm not the mob, like I don't want to steal, to plunder, to sell good drugs, but good because it makes me feel accomplished when I use it, but not because I get something from it, I will explain better. I'm going to go through en passant and then I'll pull the strings one by one, okay? There's so many things on the internet for you to see what people are thinking about. I know there are so many things that you should be reading, but I always like to see what people are thinking. I'm not exaggerating, but at least half of the sentences that I found went a little bit like this. All the good that you do, you will receive twice more. What do you think about that? Is there anyone that works for the capital market? Do you know an investment that gives 200% of profit like this one? It's difficult, right? So it's a good deal. So why do I do that? Because good is what I'm supposed to do as a human being, because that is the meaning of life. No, because it's a good deal. Double my investment because it's 200% of profit. Let's be honest. So another one was really interesting. Committing a crime isn't worthwhile. I found it great. I thought, what if it was worthwhile? We would be in trouble because if, you, if it pays well, who's to tell? isn't it and so on there are so many crazy things we don't think anymore and we use that as a stimulus so how are you going to stimulate someone to be good like that there is a, a sentence from milo fernandes that says if a mischievous guy knew how being good was worthwhile he would be mischievously good in other words with such an objective i don't think it's the goodness we're looking for those are small traps and we're going to talk a little bit about them later on. Do you see that people are always falling into these traps all the time? Do you, and people will tell you, do good and you will receive twice more and you will nod and agree and you will send the sentence everyone, oh, this is super inspiring. I think that so as well. Come on, let's think, okay? So another thing that I would like to show you is this thing. The objective of good is to do that to you. As a final resort, in a secret, a paparazzi photographed the secret document of good and found out its intention. Did you understand what he wants to do to you? His objective is to conduct you in the you know's direction. And how, how and why does he intend to do that? First of all, the good legitimacy practice without second intentions with power with will with love and all of its attributes all of them they are all part of goods gang 
And why, what they want to do to you, first of all, they want you to be less superficial, for you to dive deep inside yourself and find your best profound identity. It's good to start to do that. Start practicing good, and soon you will start doing having those, those ideas and wanting to reflect, wanting to look within and to know yourself. That is the first thing I'm going to do to you. And then that is what I'm going to do to you. Indeed, everything I've learned so, so far is superficiality, custom habit. It's something I've learned. Somebody told me the culture put inside my head, but I haven't found myself yet. And that is how you're going to start thinking about noticing something that is beyond that superficial shallow that is uh, the layer that is around you. So you are like a bead of a necklace that only knows yourself, that is made of glass, for example. And there is this gap inside it. There is a, and it says, I see the emptiness inside myself. But after a little while, she can identify a little bit of silver inside this heart that exists inside of it. It's made of silver. And he, she thinks, oh, I know my essence now. I am very complete. Do you understand this beat story? It's your story. So pay close attention to it, okay? So it discovers the small piece of silver inside itself. And it's extremely happy saying, like, I, I found my essence. It wants to tell everyone about it and shares a, a shared this finding with everybody. What is the last chapter of the beat story? When she notices that the silver that is inside, it's this piece of, uh, of silver that is inside of it, it's not only a piece of silver, it's a, a whole bead that is going through all of the necklace as well. And it's the cosmos, it's the anima mundi, though, of the world soul. It seems to be an episode of what it is. It's the essence. It's recognizing what always has been. Do you understand that? We've always been only one. When we betray each other, when we are betraying ourselves. So it makes you recognize that unit has always been. And you are the one that hadn't seen it before. Goodness wants you to do that. To, to find your own heart and from your heart it will make you discover the heart of the world and make you notice that you're part of the the heart of the world so fraternity in a, as a final resort as we will see later it's recognition you don't create fraternity you don't you just know it because it already exists you simply awaken your heart and consequently the heart of the world simply that is the intention of goodness it will take you there and it uh, pulls you from the sphere removes you from the superficiality pulls you to reflection and the lie from the intellectual capacity to have your own ideas one day you will generate your and and i believe that it will find your own essence and one day it will show that this essence is not only yours is an episode of the world's essence as well so having that in mind, you can help it. And starting now, you can start behaving as someone that knows, at least intellectually, that the end of the story is this one, that we're not going to create unity. You, we're just going to recognize it because unit has always been, and unit always has been a reality of the universe. We're simply preparing ourselves to see it. We're going to see something that has always been. Is that too abstract for you? But you will see that this is fundamental, okay? This is a notion. Now you already have a notion. You remember that goodness is efficiency. It needs to be efficient for something. Now we know goodness is efficient to make me see and integrate myself with the unit, right? Okay, I see. So the tools it's going to use, all the human strengths. It will use will, love, intelligence, concentration, attention, creativity. It will use all of those attributes to give you vitality and activate them the most and guide all the human strengths. It will teach you to use your own tools once you know the reason why to do them, why to use them. Okay, so goodness is a UNOS tool and it will take you back home to it. So let's continue. Before we start the second part, I will open for questions 
the, the, I will open the floor for questions because our time isn't long. There are so many things and I haven't gone through a lot. Goodness is efficient and is able to connect you with your own identity and to develop it. And it will connect you to your own reality and to, uh, to develop it, to see that, to develop. I like this verb more than evolving. Why is this, this verb more interesting than evolving? In Spanish, it's desarrollar. It comes from a Latin origin and it shows how they understood the Egyptian traditions. The Egyptian, Egyptians had a very sacred papyri and a very interesting transcript about it. And they were rolled up. So you needed to unroll them to see the content inside. And that passed to the Greeks and the Romans this idea of evolution being something of unrolling our papyri to see what 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 is the word that is re hidden inside ourselves a small silver bead the word that was hidden inside of you and it's not something that you are going to become it's something that you have always been and you're just going to recognize that and it's something that is your ally that you can count with so i've already talked about plato's point of view about it good unites inside and out so something that doesn't have anything that is good, cannot even manifest. So we stop thinking about the many cases, this so popular point of view. This person is 100% evil, 100% good. They don't exist. That doesn't exist. That person is highly explosive. That person this is, go is going to explode because she doesn't have anything that is good. After Plato, I was really suspicious with a, human, a woman that was cooking in my house. I started thinking that her food was highly explosive. So there are no absolutes. People have something good inside of them or else they wouldn't be manifested. And if that they have something good inside, you need to recognize them, see that, and to help them see that. That is allowing your own goodness to the other person's goodness, helping the person to bring experiences from inside out and recognize them because there are no absolutes, no 100% good and 100% evil. We are a mix of both. And the development of men, the evolution of men is to make good win over evil because we're walking towards uno and good unites and evil separates. So it's not a good idea for us to stay in the other direction. The direction defines the top of a pyramid. And if I am going upwards, the tendency is that I'm a little bit more similar to the you know inside and every time more harmonious and a little bit more uh, harmonious with the creatures and the environment around me. Understanding each one's role, each one's drama. And if I am becoming more and more close to the other person, I am going up. If I am going further away and more distant, that I am, I'm getting further away, that is bad. You need to start thinking about that. The degree of integration within yourself, knowing how to put each one in their place, that is good. So the universe is, is, is multiple and you're going to have to find your place and for each thing. So I have already talked about this. Everything that needs that exists needs to pay tribute to good or else it will explode so one thing a paying tribute to to good and another is making good be predominant in your life one day uh there was a serial killer uh interview if the person doesn't have any lucidity to do the things he needs to be good at least in something at least at, at his house with the dog is good or else he wouldn't exist he needs to pay tribute to good or else he wouldn't exist so maybe he treats the his dog really really well so that's where he gets the bond that he needs to continue being alive you can't have good in one uh, empty room in your house you need to make it predominant be predominant in your life to evolve each day and through our example in our capacity to distinguish go to to distinguish good by making it grow on people around us this one is really important to understand the good person versus a nice person a nice person is a stereotype in our society that kills me inside the person that is being explored used sponsoring a trickster saying 
Oh, I can't harm anyone. I can't say no to anyone. No, that is not a good person. That is a nice person that can keep, be contributing for evil due to weakness. He is an accessory of evil due to weakness. In other words, deep down, there is no goodness. There is some sort of demagogy. Everyone treats me well. Look at how nice I am. So there are a series, a series of flaws behind this idea of being a nice person. Even if you consider he's a good intention person, he has the inclination of doing good deeds. It's a person that has a good nature. He's just naive. Okay, fine. But that is not goodness. A good person is a strong, rational, and aware. A goodness has to do with wisdom. A good person is a wise person at some degree because there isn't e either an absolute wisdom on earth. At some degree, he's mature enough and he asks, when you ask him something, he, he, he doesn't pay attention to what you're saying. You're, he, he pays attention to what you need. He is tough. He interrupts you like a good mother to a son that would stick his finger in that outlet. Let me stick the finger to the outlet, mommy. Look at me, how nice I am. No, of course not. If you are a good mom, you're going to say no, or else he's going to be electrocuted. So you need to understand that is really important for you. You need to see the vision behind that, the intention behind it. A good person sees the intention behind you. He has a maturity to be able to deal with the facts of life and their real goodness have to be supported in, with uh, wisdom. A naive, good-natured and unwise person is a nice person. He gives the worst impression because anybody that has a certain protagonistic nature and that has fire inside, has persistency and wants to do something with life, can't stand a nice person. They are weak. I, for Christ's sake, I don't want to go. I want to go to. I don't. Wanna go, I ra I'd rather go to hell than being like that person, isn't it? The youngster have this mentality. Look, I've already taught philosophy to teenagers from 15 years old on. It's really hard because they simply don't care about names, words. They care about what they're seeing, living. They are a lot more intuitive than rational. So when people say, "Oh," You're doing this. You won't. Or you have to be a nice person. They think, I don't care about being a nice person. I just want to pursue my dreams. I want to accomplish my goals. I want to fly. If, if flying is bad, I, I'm a bad flying being, but I will fly. So it's horrible for people who, that are courageous to be sick of goodness because goodness is strength. It gives us wings and it, it doesn't cut anyone's wing because we have this horrible notion of the nice person. It's the person that can only say yes, smile, and please everyone. And everyone is going to the abyss. But, oh, I just did what he wanted me to do. Okay, then. So goodness is strongly attached to wisdom. It's a subproduct of wisdom. Remember that thing I told you, that it fits itself from justice, love, fraternity. It fits from these attributes, and it generates wisdom as a result. The more you walk... Well, towards the goodness inside and as an ally, it will make you more mature, more wiser and ready to become the most perfect, efficient servant of the next step of life. In fact, goodness loves efficiency. It wants to push all creatures to the to direction of good, of God, of, you know, whatever you may call it. I love this. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, Stephen Pressfield an American author that I talk about all the time. He has a book called the War of Art, the a wonderful book. I recommend a thousand times. Everyone is mad at me because it's sold out here. I'm sorry. But he talks about that this great compromise, this great soul's calling that we have, this need to push all creatures a millimeter in God's direction, in the unit's direction, in our dream's direction, in the mission of the human being's direction. A small millimeter makes your life worthwhile. You push the little. That's why you need to have a little bit more wisdom for you to know what's the best way to push it, what angle is better, more efficient, okay? So goodness will walk more and more side by side wisdom. It, it is the tool that of wisdom. And many times the good people are not well seen in history. Look how evil he was, but he was, I am everything I am because of him, but he was evil. Oh, 
haven't you seen people saying that about parents, grandparents? He was horrible, but well, I am everything I am because of him. So I wanted that badness. I wanted that evilness for me. We need people that can push others in the direction of good. I think there is a misunderstanding there. By thy work, I shall know thee, but not by thy magogy, by the demagogy or by popularity, by thy work, I shall know thee. And there is Hamlet, a strong Shakespearean character giving his opinion on the subject. Even a good thing can grow too big and die from its own excess. In other words, there, there shouldn't be any excesses. Everything needs to be balanced. The realest goodness isn't someone who wants to portray the good fellow or the nice person character. A person that is wimpy, that ends up being everyone's toy and have the ability to, for the goodness, equal selfishness. The person that wants to pay the credit karma debt, so he won't go to hell. But doesn't that really bother you haven't you ever seen the postmortem credit karma bill before i have there was a time a long time ago in a land not so far away a great experimental field here in new york Prophecy. we had a volunteering course we had the idea i'm not even going to tell you that i was the, the main idealizer of the course but okay it, it, i was the idea was that everyone that wanted to do social work had the nature to become a philosopher. Doesn't it seem obvious? It seems like it's obvious, but it's not. Do you know why? Well, because we started to do the volunteering courses because we are volunteers and we have a lot of experience. So we called people from all the areas who wanted to work as social assistants for the elderly children and gave them a six month training for each professional to do their on, on their own work on their own fields. And at the end of the training, we would talk about philosophy to them, giving them uh, aggregating value to what they did, where they worked. And the majority of the times I was involved with these interviews, I talked to them. Do you believe that many of these people had no interest? And I used to say, but this can help you with to do things better, to attend, pe meet people's demands. Oh, no, I don't want to do things better or to do this for the rest of my life. I just want to do... Uh, a little bit to compensate the mistakes that I've done in the past. I just want to be even with God, to be even when facing death. So, in other words, I want to guarantee my place in paradise. When I am even with my credit card bill, I don't want to deal with this anymore. So, I don't want to improve my, my, my actions. I just want to pay my quota, my fill installments. So, what do you think about that? So it's a curious thing. It has to do with this Shakespearean passage. Less goodness can become an investment for you to pay off your debts in advance, okay? So more goodness can become weakness. In other words, finding a fair balance where you can act with a mission spirit, with compromise, with an honorable sense of being a human being and doing what is expected from a human being on earth without another expectation other than being human, being good, good, goodness itself. Will there be other benefits? Yes, but you shouldn't act because of them, because that is what corresponds to you as a human being.